Rebecca Aylward was born on the 28th of February 1995 in Bridgend, South Wales, the eldest of three siblings. Beautiful baby, couldn't stop looking at her. I mean, everybody just worshipped Rebecca as a baby. She, she looked like a little doll, rosy cheeks, and just a beautiful baby. You just can't believe she's yours. No feeling like it. Rebecca has a strong bond with her younger siblings, Jessica and Jack. We were all, all very close and they're wonderful people, wonderful little people. Hi, Mum, happy Mother's Day. Love from Beck, Jack and Jess. <laughs> Rebecca's loving nature extends to her school life. If anybody was getting bullied, she would be devastated. She would really, really be upset and feel their pain. She was like my best friend. Like She was always there for me and like always supported me through the things that I had. At secondary school, Rebecca finds herself in the same class as Joshua Davis. Davis was in her class, but she wasn't really aware of him for the first year or so. Supply teacher Lorraine Sturringer teaches both Rebecca and Josh in her classes. He used to sit with the quiet boys. Rebecca sat with the quiet girls, and they used to get on with their work. He was the same, and I remember, you know, he responded well to praise. If I praised him for his work, he would be very pleased. I didn't notice anything really odd about him. Forensic psychologist Dr Kerry Nixon works with Merseyside Police, profiling serious violent offenders. She's been analysing Josh's behaviour in school. Very clever, clever young man who um, charmed pretty much everybody. Teachers, his friends, he was known as the leader of the group. Um, he was an attention seeker. People said that you would always know when Davis was in the room uh, because he would want the attention on himself. Like Josh, Rebecca is a diligent, hard-working student with academic ability. She had great plans for her future, but she wasn't very vocal about it. You know, she just kept it. She was a model student in class. Rebecca had a really bright future in front of her. She was really smart. She wouldn't show it, but when she went, uh, had to think or work, she was so sharp and so fast and so much talent, so much mind. Uh, she was really, really intelligent. Constantly into books and all our grades, they were A or A star. Rebecca and Josh become close friends and she invites him to spend time with her family. I saw him walking down the drive. They, they both got off the school bus together, straight from school, and I, I thought, oh, he, he looks really nice. You know, he, he looked gentle and happy, smiling, and he came in and everybody in the family liked him. He was really charming and polite. Just, just a really nice boy. Psychologist Emma Kenny works with victims of domestic abuse in her clinics and has been looking into this case. Any mother has questions about their children's choices in partners. If they're a bad kid, if they're not doing well at school, if people in the local area are negative about them. But in Davy's case, nothing demonstrated those factors. He succeeded academically, he was outgoing, he was popular, considered a leader. He was in class top sets. This was the perfect boyfriend for your daughter. But there appears to be another side to Josh's personality. A lot of people did like him, but again, at the same time, a lot of people disliked him. Like, the figure that he wanted to be, like the leader, obviously he was gonna have a few enemies and some people were intimidated by him as well. Davis had a massive ego and he was a real control freak at the same time. Everything had to be under his control. He just thought he could beat anyone, was smarter than anyone, was just better than anyone at anything. He couldn't, he would just succeed at it because he was Davis. Davis's behavior displays some very narcissistic traits. He wanted to be in charge. He liked being the leader. He liked getting people to do what he wanted them to do. Josh makes it clear to Rebecca that he wants them to take their friendship to the next level. In the October um, 2009, they, um, she said, um, he, wants, he wants us to get together. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he's your boyfriend. And she said, yes. 
they were really good together, I guess, because they were like best friends and she like cared for him so much, like it's just, just the whole world was him. When Becca told me she was dating Josh, I, I thought it was great, you know, because both similar, ambitious, in, intelligent, polite pupils. I thought the same as everyone else, it's a, it's a nice relationship. He was her first boyfriend. Um, and like I said, he got on great with the family, he'd spend a lot of time with us. Rebecca would ring uh, lunchtime and say, is it okay for Josh to come over? And I said, right, okay, I'll get your tea ready by the time you all come home from school. And, you know, that was just a regular thing. They'd just have a laugh, they'd be on the computer. I'd see him around school all the time and like, they were just all over each other and they seemed so happy and they always had, they had loads of pictures together of the house. He got on so well with the entire family. I mean, he just seemed perfect. Rebecca, she adored Josh. Um, the all she talked about. She really did worship him. He was just part of the family. And um, he used to say to me, he said, you know, I swear to protect her, I'll always protect her. And she's safe with me. And he, he kept reassuring me, she's safe with me. I'll always look after her, you know? And, uh, and I believed him. I believed him, but he fooled us all. Sonia is alarmed when she finds out what Josh keeps in his bedroom. He had uh, antique guns and knives and very unusual things in his bedroom. When I first saw the knives, I thought, Man, there's a lot of knives in here, but I didn't think anything of it. I just thought it was a collection for him. They used to go to his room, all of them used to go to his room and listen to music. And the first time I think Jessica went there, um, he came out of his bedroom and he held a knife to her and kind of, and it, it took her aback, you know, it, it frightened her. As well as his collection of weapons, Josh writes stories about killing and draws pictures of a macabre nature. I remember probably about a year before that, Rebecca showed me some of his drawings and paintings that he had done and they were very dark. He seems obsessed with killing generally. His obsession with weapons and drawing uh, depictions of devils and monsters is just another factor of that. For Sonia, she had invited Davies into her home because she trusted that he would be a good person. And that's mostly how we need to be in life. He was a very, very sly, clever young man. And nobody could have known what he was capable of. She thought that there was romance in the air. And all the time, he was plotting to murder her. This is about killing somebody, and he's texting about a breakfast. That, that's shocking. He's got all the hallmarks of a psychopath, everything. It's January 2010, and 14-year-old Rebecca Aylward has been dating classmate Joshua Davis for three months. But this love affair is about to turn sour. He'd spent that weekend with us, um, the end of January, I think it was, the last week of January. And um, he said, just before he left, his mother picked him up and he said, that's, that's the best weekend I've ever had in my life. I really enjoyed it, because they really did have fun that weekend, all of them, you know. They, that's all they did was laugh and they were taking funny photographs of each other. Rebecca painted his nails. He insisted on her painted, painting his nails. And, and um, it, it was just great. And, and then he said his goodbyes to us, as he usually did. A few hours later, Davis dumps Rebecca without explanation. Rebecca, she was really upset. And I asked her what was the matter. And I said, it's him, is it? And she said, uh, yeah, and I said, what, are you, have you finished? And she said, yes, he, he just finished, finished the relationship out of the blue. Couldn't understand why, and I said, well, well why, has he got another girlfriend or anything? And she said, I, she was really baffled by him, as was I. Psychologist and relationships expert Emma Kenny believes Davis knows exactly what he's doing. To me, that says that he enjoyed the drama. He enjoyed making Rebecca feel bad. He knew that he had power over her feelings and he was willing to put that to negative purpose. 
Davis's attitude to Rebecca changes dramatically. After they'd broken up, he um, told everyone that uh, she was pregnant. Yeah, he used to do anything, like the worst things, to run her into the ground. Everyone he knew, he would just bend to go against her. Like, new people he met, the first thing he would be doing was trying to make them hate Becca. And he would just hound her and just be determined to run her into the ground. That was, like, his sole priority in life. Davis had broken her down over a long time. Dr. Kerry Nixon explains how bullying is an all too common form of domestic abuse in teenage relationships. We know that often teenagers will be involved in domestic abuse situations and often will um, bring in other people as part of that abuse. So his systematic bullying behaviour towards Rebecca is, is not um, that unusual. Of course, the events that followed is, is unusual. Wary of Davis's behaviour, Rebecca makes a chilling prediction to her friends. Becca often thought he would try and kill her. She was, like, terrified of him. He seemed to obsessively hate Rebecca. Um, there was a comment by one of his friends that, oh, you know, forget about it, soon you'll be leaving school and you'll never have to see Rebecca again. And he made a comment that her being aware that she was living and, and breathing was enough to, um, to anger him. So obsessive ruminations and thoughts about Rebecca um, that led to him planning to kill her. Davis starts telling his friends about his sinister plots. Every single way you can think of killing someone, he, he would have mentioned doing this in some way to her. Like this bridge in Abercambic, he wanted to push her off and um, make her jump off maybe. Because she couldn't swim, he'd just leave her there to drown. Davis's friends pass off his comments as just teenage bravado, but Dr. Kerry Nixon believes Davis was deadly serious. I think his friends thought that this was all, you know, a, a bit of a joke, and it was, if you were to kill Rebecca, how would you go about it? Um, for him, it was very serious, and the level of detail that he was starting to give, and the fact that he was obsessing and Think of in intricate details of how he would go about it shows how um, at risk Rebecca was. Journalist Bob Arthur has been reporting on murders across South Wales for almost 40 years and covered this case. He made various threats to kill her. He said he would poison her. And indeed, the police found a, a concoction of um, Deadly Nightshade and Foxglove, which he had mixed together. He'd done the research, he'd got the ingredients. He had made the potion. They found a pestle and mortar and Foxgloves crushed in Coca-Cola in um, the grandparents' summer house. He became obsessed at that time with killing Rebecca and would actually plan about how he would go about killing her. And what we know in terms of risk assessment of somebody planning something like that, if they're giving very vague, open threats, um, it may not be as much as a concern. But if somebody's actually planning the meticulous details of how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it, and what they're going to do, and in this case, Dave is actually experimenting with poisons, this indicates that this was very serious and therefore was very high risk. In the summer of 2010, Rebecca becomes unwell and starts having blackouts. She spends time in hospital having tests, but the cause of her illness is undiagnosed. Yet, unlike the rest of their friendship group, Davis shows no concern for her welfare. When Rebecca came out of hospital, I said, I've, um, I've Josh contacted you and asked you how you are or anything like that, you know, because I thought that he would have been visiting her in the hospital. And she said, no, nothing at all. He's, he hasn't mentioned nothing as if it has never happened. That was a totally different person to the person that sat in my house. As Rebecca recovers, Davis continues to plot her demise. He and a group of his uh, friends from school used to meet in the same cafe every Saturday morning for breakfast. And um, that was where this, this very, very sad joke emerged, where one of his friends jokingly said that 
if he did kill her, he'd buy him a breakfast. And Davis sort of latched onto this. And in the days leading up to the murder, he, he sent text messages along the lines of, soon you'll owe me that breakfast, soon you'll have to buy me that breakfast, soon you'll have to keep your word. You'd almost think that he wasn't going to go through with it because he was so superficial about it, so matter of fact. You know, the breakfast comment, am I going to get that breakfast? So matter of fact that he was actually, this is about killing somebody and he's texting about a breakfast. That, that's shocking. In September 2010, Rebecca returns to school and begins a new relationship with another boy. But Davis appears jealous and starts showing an interest in her again. They talked a few times about getting back together and things, but like he would just sometimes switch back into hating her, but it was more and more staying on the liking of her. She would say, I still care about him because no one's ever looked after me and been like that with me before, so I'd love that again. So she would have gone back to him any time and she was so hopeful that that time they'd be together. Davis knows Rebecca wants to get back with him, and he appears interested in rekindling their relationship. When you look at the different journeys that Rebecca and Davis were taking, you couldn't be further polarities. Here we have a young girl desperate to be with her boyfriend, in love, wanting to do whatever it took to make it work, genuinely, authentically caring for this boy. On the other side, you have Davis, a boy who all the while is talking to friends about how he intends to harm her, what he'd like to do to her, and ultimately how he intends to destroy her. On the evening of Friday, the 22nd of October, Davis asks Rebecca to meet him in Aberkenfig and implies that they're going to get back together. She was talking to him on the internet uh, in the night and she'd show me the conversation. She'd be sitting next to me and I'd say, oh, look, he's changed his profile picture. And I said, what's he planning then? And she said, I know, I was curious about that. Now, every time that he does something unusual, he, he changes his profile picture. Like if he was going to ask somebody to go out with him or if he was going to do something different, very, very different. And the picture he's got up is of the actual woods. He appeared to not show any sense of concern that he was advertising to everybody that he was showing them where he was going to kill Rebecca. The next morning, Rebecca is up early in anticipation of her date with Davis. She's really excited about meeting him and fetching him back and hoping that he persuaded her that he, you know, he, won, he was going to ask her back out and, and she thought that he was going to because she, she assured me he changed and he was back to the old Josh, the, the nice Josh. She spent time getting herself ready, putting her makeup on, doing her hair. Her mother recalls that she was dancing and singing in her bedroom. This was the period of joy for her. She was hopeful. She trusted him. She had no suspicions whatsoever that he was plotting to kill her. And she bought a new outfit to go as well. Everything that she wore was brand new. And she was really looking forward to it. But Davis is not planning on a happy reunion. That morning, he and his friends meet for breakfast in the cafe. And later that day, he leaves them to meet up with Rebecca. Chillingly, he tells them, the time has come. He knew that he could easily get her there. He knew that she still had feelings for him and that one way of getting her there was to uh, indicate to her that he wanted to get back together, which again is very manipulative of him. Um, she, he was taking advantage of her feelings for him. Around one o'clock on Saturday, October the 23rd, 2010, Rebecca is dropped off at San train station in Bridge End to meet Davis. It's the last time her family see her. Davis changes the meeting place at the last minute. She, she rung me and she said, oh, mum, she said, I'm in Pandy Park. I said, why are you in Pandy Park? And she said, well, he's... And I said, I thought you were in the car on your way back now with, with... I said, is he with you? And she said, no. 
I'm really not happy with you being in Pondy Park there by yourself. What's he playing at? She said, I don't know. Davis is acting strange and Sonia is concerned. He now asks Rebecca to come into the village to meet him there. I said, I'm staying on the phone with you on your walk back to the village. She finally got to Church Street and I said, is there any sign of him? She said then, um, yeah, I think this is him coming down the hill. Yes, it is him, definitely. And I said to her, are you sure it's Josh Davis? And she said, yes, it's him. And I said, are you 100% sure that's Josh Davis coming down the hill? And she said, yes, it's Josh. And, um, and you know, I, wasn't, I still wasn't satisfied with that. I asked her the same question again. And she said, yeah, he's standing in front of me right now, she said. Now, normally in, in school, when he's around, I can hear him always in the background on the, on the phones. Or he'll just take the phone off Rebecca and say, oh, are you saw now with things? And he'll have a chat with me. But that day, I didn't hear a sound. Didn't hear him at all. Nothing, nothing. which was very unusual for him. I said bye, and she said, bye, Mum, love you, see you later. It is the last time Sonia speaks to her daughter. She thought that there was romance in the air, that they were meeting to maybe rekindle their relationship, become boyfriend and girlfriend again, and all the time he was plotting to murder her. To be able to lure somebody and hear their screams and still continue to then kill them. You can't be overstressed how dangerous a person is if they can do that at the age of 16. What can they do at the age of 26 or 36? He totally took us all in. He, he really did. We all believed him and I hate him for doing those things. On October the 23rd, 2010, 15 year old Rebecca Aylward meets up with her ex boyfriend, Joshua Davis hoping to rekindle their relationship. But Davis has other ideas. At no point did he waver from his plan. You know, it was planned to lure her there. He changed the location to try and put people off the scent. Um, he manipulated her into going there. He bragged about it before and after. Um, so all of that suggests that he was feeling very little emotion about what he was about to do to Rebecca. When you look back, you're like, it's so obvious that you should have done something. I mean, if someone was watching your life, they'd be like, what are you doing, you idiot? Do something. But when you're in there, you're like, no, there's nothing too bad going on. He's just a really messed up kid. And then when it happens, you're like, it was a lot more than that, and I should have seen it coming. Around 5 p.m., Sonia's sister calls her, concerned that she hasn't been able to contact her niece. And I said, you know, what is, what is it? And she said, well, I, I tried ringing Rebecca and I can't get an answer, and that was never the case. But there is no word from Rebecca, and the family frantically starts calling around her friends. Jessica was ringing everybody. They also got another friend of Rebecca's and Jessica's. And my sister, Jessica, went down to Aberkem Fig and started searching while I was looking around on that Saturday night. We were ringing our phone constantly. Sometimes it would ring, sometimes it would go to answer phone. And, and I knew that, that it hadn't run out of, you know, the battery wasn't low or anything like that. And I just couldn't understand why she wasn't answering. There is no sign of Rebecca. And Sonia calls the police and reports her daughter missing. Then later that evening, after numerous attempts, she manages to get hold of Davis. I eventually rang Davis and I got through to him. And he kind of said, oh, oh all right, son. You know, not, not his usual confident self. And I said, um, have, have you seen Rebecca today? And he said, no, uh, no, I've been up my grands all day. He said, I've been here all day. But Davis is lying to Sonia, the truth is that that afternoon, after meeting up with Rebecca, Davis spends the afternoon with his two friends. He posts on Facebook that he is chilling with friends just a few hours after Rebecca is last seen. Then he and his best friend spend the evening at Davis's grandmother's watching television. He is there 
when he speaks to Sonia. It's shocking and it is rare. You don't see traits like that in general offenders. That lack of remorse and that glibness and that um, apparent disregard for the family shows how callous an individual he is. I said, have you spoke to Rebecca today? And he said, yeah. He said, she was in Abercamp Fig. And I rang her, he said, and said that I'm stuck at the moment in my grandmother's house and I can't get back for another two hours. He kind of stumbled and I said, I, I need to get this straight now because I've got the police involved. I said, I've reported this to the police. Are you telling me now that it was not you standing in front of Rebecca when I was talking to her on the phone? And he said, no. He didn't seem bothered, but I thought that he was, at the time of speaking to him, I thought he was concerned and he was in a bit of shock that she'd gone missing, you know? And um, I didn't think nothing of it then. And I said, if you hear anything, let me know straight away. And he said, I will. As news of Rebecca's disappearance breaks, friends post their concerns on Facebook. Davis himself comments. He says he feels sorry for her mother but Davis knows exactly where Rebecca is, and so do his friends. As Sonia spends the night desperate for any news, police continue their search. And then the next morning, one of Davis's friends cracks and tells his parents that Rebecca may be hurt. They call the police. And she said he's just gone out on a rapid response. And when she said them words, I knew there was something wrong. But all the time, Davis remains silent. In my work with violent offenders, um, you see offenders on a daily basis who don't show remorse. But often they don't show remorse and it's violence with peers. So as part of gang activity, as part of um, drug taking, drug dealing activity. But when it's such a, um, a murder like this, where it's somebody that he knew, that somebody who did nothing to deserve it, to have that level of um, glibness, that level of no remorse, of lack of regard for the family, it is quite rare. It's really indicative of a, of a very disturbed, violent offender. Sonia's worst fears are about to become a reality. When I arrived at my sister's house, um, there was an officer there waiting. And um, just by the expression on his face, I knew what had happened. And I think I shouted at him, have you got him? Have you got the person that did it? And he looked at me and he said, who? But then shock hit me then and I just had to run to the bathroom, you know? It's every mother's worst nightmare. The police find Rebecca's body face down in the woods near Aberkenfig. You can't describe what it's like. It's, everything kind of slows down and you, it feels as if you're walking, you know, I, I don't know, through knee deep in water or something. It's just everything slows down, but yet everything's happening so fast around you. Sonia barely has time to digest what has happened before the police have news for her. They informed me that they'd arrested two boys and one of them was Joshua Davis. And my first reaction to the police, well, it, it wouldn't be Josh. And they all shook their heads, uh, you know, at the same time. And they, they said, we believe it was Joshua Davis that did it. And I just couldn't believe it, couldn't believe it. When the police told me they'd found the body, I immediately thought Davis. I said, they said, there's anyone that you think? And I said, Davis, Davis, 100%, there's no one else. When I saw it on the news and that someone had been arrested, I immediately straight away thought it was Josh. There was no doubt in my mind that I thought it was him. The police agree, and Davis is charged with murder. The dark taboo that Rebecca's killer could be her schoolboy boyfriend sent shockwaves around the country. The trial begins in July 2011. Well, Swansea Crown Court does see 
a lot of high-profile murder cases. It's just a really, really sad case, and one that will definitely not just stick in my memory, but will stick in the memory of, of, of the community. But Davies doesn't seem to have a care in the world. He dressed like you know, like a teenager going for going for their first job interview. You know, maybe not dressed in a, in in a suit. But throughout the trial, he was very kind of vague in his expressions. It seemed like if things didn't really phase him, or he, he wasn't he wasn't paying attention to what was happening. We all seemed to be washing over him. He showed very little interest in his own murder trial. There were some sessions he didn't even attend. Spent most of it looking down at the floor or around the room, not showing any great interest in the evidence or what was being said about him and showing, showing no reaction to what was said. Everyone in the court was moved. Everyone was full of emotion, even all the officials. You know, it was, it's an emotional thing when a young person is brutally taken, and yet he had no, there was no feeling. And when I, when I looked at his eyes, I thought, there is nothing. It's like he had no soul. The shock of seeing a 16-year-old A-grade student with a promising future standing on trial for murder makes this case so chilling. His own barrister described him as well-educated, well-liked, caring. He described him as caring. Uh, he was tall, good-looking, he had girlfriends. Um, but he just throws it all away. In court, Davis denies Rebecca's murder and blames his best friend for her death. He claims he and Rebecca had played a joke on his friend which had gone wrong and his friends got angry and killed her with a rock. It was horrible watching him on the stand, reenacting what he did. The barrister asked him, could you explain to me how the other boy did it? And he did, and watching him do that, you know that it was him doing it. That was hard. The court hears how Davis constructed his plan and then executed it that fateful afternoon. Rebecca was less than five foot two inches tall. She weighed less than six stone. He was quite a tall lad for his age, reasonably strong. Uh, she wouldn't have been any, in any uh, way able to defend herself. The manner in which he killed her on that day was very cold, very calculated. High levels of violence were used in the murder. The court is told how Davis killed Rebecca but the defendant shows no emotion. She was screaming and then, yeah, then he used a rock and, yeah, yeah. Davis caves Rebecca's skull in with the rock, then leaves her face down in the woods. He calls his friends, who are waiting for him outside the woods. And when asked if he's still with Rebecca, chillingly, Davis replies with a laugh, define with. Presumably meaning that, yes, I am with her, but she's dead, so am I really with her? I'm with her body. Which is a, 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 a bizarre response from somebody who's just killed a young girl, to try and make a joke of it. He was even trying to make light of the situation. And that comes across as, as beyond cold and very indicative um, of antisocial personality. Davis then invites his best friend to see the body. But then to tell his friend where he was and to invite him to the location and to show him the body is uh, it's just uh, uh, very, very difficult to understand what on earth was going through his head. Uh, and he told his friend that he also tried to break a neck and told his friend that it was far more difficult than he, somebody might imagine to break somebody's neck. After trying to break a neck, Davis tells his friend that she was screaming. And then I picked up the rock and started to hit her with it. The worst part was feeling and seeing her skull give way. He actually brags about how difficult it is uh, to try and break somebody's neck, which takes a real uh, unbelievable level of callousness and no feeling whatsoever to be able to lure somebody and hear their screams and still continue to then kill them by repeatedly bashing them over the head.
On the 27th of July 2011, at Swansea Crown Court, the jury retire to consider their verdict. In almost 40 years of reporting on murder cases and other serious cases, I think Joshua Davis is one of the most dangerous people I've come across. He's got all the hallmarks of a psychopath, everything. Davis killed her daughter for absolutely no reason, purely for his own gratification. It's the first time I've been here since the police brought us up. I just feel empty. It's a horrible, horrible place. On the 27th of July, 2011, as the country's media watched on, the jury in the murder trial of Joshua Davis reconvened to deliver their verdict. Davis is found guilty of Rebecca's murder. He is sentenced to life imprisonment and ordered to serve a minimum of 14 years. Yes, we see homicides, domestic homicides, Yes, we see lack of remorse. You know, yes, we've seen teenagers who have killed within a domestic abuse context. But this level of planning, this level of superficiality, this level of uh, glibness and intention seeking and disregard for people's feelings, we don't see often. Davis had been taken in by Rebecca's family, who treated him almost like a, a son of their own. But his response was to murder their daughter. He totally took us all in. He, he really did. We all believed him, and I hate him for doing those things. And I, I just, you know, I, I just can't, uh, I can't believe he could have done that. This horrific murder is every parent's worst nightmare. Popular schoolboy Davis seemed to have a bright future in front of him, but he throws it all away with the brutal murder of Rebecca. Davis killed her daughter for absolutely no reason, purely for his own gratification. He didn't care about her. He didn't offer her any dignity. He just killed her because it was something he wanted to do. And to know that your child meant nothing in those moments, that's something that will take a lifetime to get over. Unless Davis admits to the murder and explains his motives, we may never know why Rebecca was killed. Dr. Kerry Nixon believes that Davis shows signs of deep-seated psychological issues. Davis's traits and behavior, both prior to the murder during the murder in, which, in the manner he killed her and his subsequent behaviour following the murder in terms of showing friends the body, etc. All of those behaviours and his mannerisms and things that he did are indicative of antisocial personality. He's got all the hallmarks of a psychopath, everything. He's a very callous and dangerous young man. He, he, he can't be overstressed how dangerous a person is if they can do that at the age of 16. What can they do at the age of 26 or 36? It's very chilling to see a 16-year-old boy displaying these traits. There are, and um, research that I've conducted, there are teenagers who have engaged in domestic homicides. However, that level of lack of remorse is rare. For a boy of that age to carry out a murder when he's got absolutely no motive for doing so is very, very disturbing. In almost 40 years of reporting on murder cases and other serious cases, I think Joshua Davis is one of the most dangerous people I've come across. Those closest to Rebecca and her family still find it hard to come to terms with her murder. Her sister and her brother, they loved her so much. She was the oldest and they looked up to her humbly. They, they like literally worshipped the ground that she walked on. He knew more than anyone how much those two loved her and how much her mum loved her. I can't stand him. I can't believe it. I hate him every day for it. Later on in hindsight, you start thinking about things you could have noticed or... But yeah, it is, it's absolutely chilling. It's, 
probably the worst thing imaginable to, to know, someone you know to, to be capable of doing something like that. Sonia decides to retrace her daughter's footsteps on that fateful afternoon. It's the first time she's been back since the police took her there in the days after her daughter's brutal murder. This was the park that Davis told Rebecca to meet at, uh, and I stayed on the phone with her all the while. I said, well, you know, you, you just need to get into the village safely now while I'm on the phone with you. And I stayed on the phone right until she met him and he'd sent her to Church Street then to meet him. He's just one evil, evil boy. She walked all the way up here um, to Church Street where she met Davis. When she hung up the phone, that was the last conversation I had with Rebecca. Sonia makes her way up to the woods where Davis killed her daughter. It's the first time I've been here since the police brought us up. Um, I brought some flowers to, to put down. I, I felt people need to know what he did, the runaround he gave her, and brought her to this horrible place. I, when I think about it on this area, um, and what a coward he was, I just, I just hate him, hate him. I just feel empty, it's a horrible, horrible place. Since Rebecca's murder, Sonia has fought to keep Davis inside prison and has launched a campaign for a life sentence to mean life. But the emotion gets too much for Sonia and she vows never to return. It wasn't Becca's choice, it was Davis's and I won't give him the satisfaction of ever coming back here again. I know how hard it was. It was really, really hard to do this today, but I felt people should know. I won't come back here again. It's blessed, it's holy ground. Um, hopefully no other bad will ever happen here again. Although Sonia's family will never be the same again, she is determined to keep her beautiful 15-year-old daughter's memory alive. Rebecca had meaning. She should have grown into a woman, got married, had children, had a career, been loved by many people, had adventures, but they have all been taken away from her. The one thing that Sonia can do is ensure that the legacy that she leaves is a positive one. Loved her family and uh, especially her brother and sister and um, just really, really clever, intelligent girl and um, just a lovely person, you know, and we miss her.